Andrei Silzenko is up next. He is an executive fellow at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. He worked for the federal government from 1972 to 2004, culminating in the position of Senior Assistant Deputy, Deputy Minister Policy at Industry Canada from 1996 to 2004. In 2003, he was awarded the Head of Public Service Award for Excellence in Policy. Andre's presentation is entitled Automotive Trade Policy from Managed Trade to Free Trade and Back to Managed Trade Again. He will provide a brief history of automobiles and trade policy toward automobiles in Canada vis-a-vis -vis the Auto Pact, FTA, NAFTA, and the USMCA. His presentation is based on his personal experience as a trade policy practitioner for 40 years. Andre. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, I actually never thought um, I would come to a day when I could actually talk about the auto pack. So I, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me because um, it's been a significant part of my life, uh, believe it or not. Uh, in fact, um, the auto pack was between 1965 and 2001, and I was involved one way or another with it for about two thirds of its duration even though I'm only still a young guy. Um, so what I'd uh, like to do is, is give you, um, I guess, a somewhat personal view of some of the events that took place in terms of the, the uh, workings of the Auto Pact and its eventual uh, demise. Um, first, uh, a little bit about how it works, because I think it's really an interesting case study, which probably will never be repeated again in our history, uh, but it was, a, it was a great policy innovation uh, because it was based on the concept of marrying protection and efficiency. Now that doesn't make sense, right? But the whole idea, which was preceded by, in the early 60s by something called the Bladen Report, from 1961 uh, was based on the notion that <clears throat> a Canadian automotive manufacturer could earn a remission of duty on imported vehicles or original equipment parts on a dollar for dollar basis to the extent that the manufacturer increased Canadian exports. So that was the notion. And what precipitated the Canadian government's concern at the time in the early 60s, uh, and uh, Craig has already mentioned this, um, is that we were running a fairly substantial trade deficit with the United States, and a big part of that trade deficit was in automotive. So there was this interest in, I mean, you could argue that there was this great interest in rationalizing the industry, but what was really driving the Canadian government in the early 60s was a way of trying to mitigate this chronic trade deficit uh, in autos. So, following the Bladen report in the early, in 1963, the then minister Bud Drury came up with a plan which was based on that and the American reaction to it was mixed. Uh, the American government at the time thought they would be like to be helpful to Canada and, and to the industry in terms of rationalizing production north-south, which wasn't the case at the time. And the, they didn't like the idea that much, but they were prepared to live with it. The only problem was that uh, an American company complained about the, the scheme and threatened uh, a countervailing duty action, uh, which was more or less automatic in those days in the United States. So a crisis ensued, and so that precipitated the actual negotiations that led to the Auto Pact. So those negotiations were led by Simon Reisman, who was actually quite instrumental in cooking up these various remission schemes in the first place. And the end result was actually quite similar 
to the Drury plan that I just described, the end result was not based on exports, but it was based on production in Canada being at a certain level. It was roughly one to one for sales, uh, production to sales. And in exchange for that, there would be duty-free trade across the border in, in both vehicles and uh, original equipment parts. The, the, the hook in all this, though, was that Canada applied the agreement differently than the United States. We applied it on a multilateral basis. So that meant that companies that benefited from the agreement, basically the big three and a few others like Volvo, uh, they could bring in uh, vehicles from anywhere in the world, as was mentioned earlier, uh, including Japan, Europe, wherever. Uh, whereas the Americans applied it on a bilateral basis only, so, so their duties for the rest of the world were still uh, helped. And so that's why the Americans needed a GATT waiver at the time to implement their part of the auto pact, and we didn't, because we said, uh, a bit tongue-in-cheek, I would guess, that we were um, implementing it on a multilateral basis and therefore didn't need a GATT waiver. So my, my original acquaintance with the Auto Pact actually was in 1978, so that's 40 years ago, when Simon Reisman was asked by the then Trudeau government, Trudeau the first, uh, to undertake a quick one-person inquiry into the problems and prospects of the industry. Now, as you saw from the previous presentation, the industry was ramping up quite dramatically in Canada following the big splurge of investment after, the, um, after 1965. Um, so you say, well, why, why the inquiry at that time? In fact, you've probably never heard of his report. Uh, I still have, from my personal archive, maybe one of the only copies in the world, uh, at, least, uh, at least hard copies in the world of, of, of the actual uh, report. Uh, but it, uh, it got lost in, within a few months of its, uh, of its uh, presentation. But what was happening, even though that auto production was ramping up quite dramatically, things weren't looking that great in, in the late 70s for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was the economy w was not in great shape, so our production was actually tailing off somewhat. But the real issue at the time was the growing competitive threat from, from Japanese manufacturers. And it peaked in the late 70s and leading into the early 80s because uh, we had, remember in the 70s, we had twin oil shocks. Well, what that did was it pushed consumers in North America to fuel-efficient cars. Well, the only folks that were making fuel-efficient cars in those days were the Japanese in any quantity. The American, you know, we're, we were still in the big boats and the gas guzzlers. So the Japanese started penetration of the North American market, started ramping up quite dramatically. And North American consumers also found out that not only were they cheap, and efficient, but they were better quality than that was being produced by the big three. So uh, this, uh, this culminated uh, in what is affectionately known as voluntary export restraints with Japanese uh, companies. Now the Americans started it and Canada soon after followed suit because uh, well, we were still in an integrated market, so, um, and I, I was personally involved in some of these negotiations with the Japanese at the time, and uh, it, uh, it was a rather elaborate ritual of pretending not to be negotiating something and, and having, a, at the end of the day, a, a mutual understanding with a wink and a nod, which magically resulted in, in the Japanese companies restraining their exports uh, to a certain level per year. Now, the, 
the funny thing happened along the way, though, with the VERs, and that is it actually, even though it gave a short-term respite to the American-based industry, it actually undercut them in the long run. And there were two reasons for this. Number one, because the, the voluntary restraints were based on units rather than value, the Japanese companies had a great incentive to export their higher value products, uh, thereby cutting into the bread and butter market of the American companies. So where do you think Lexus came from? Lexus you know, was Japanese produced, but there was an incentive to, to, to ship to the United States a $50,000 vehicle rather than a $10,000 vehicle. So they actually started penetrating the American heartland. And then the other thing that happened is that that created an incentive to invest in North America. So what you saw in the early 80s is a huge increase in Japanese investment led by Honda. Uh, and not, so the Japanese then were able to export their efficient systems, uh, keep their costs under control, because the yen had been appreciating at that time, and really stick it to the, the American companies. So in a way, you know, if you look back at the history of the VERs, it was a very perverse outcome uh, for, the, uh, for the industry. The other thing that happened, of course, was that all this Japanese investment was greenfield, brand new plants. Not only were they really good at organizing their production systems, but these were brand new plants. Whereas most of the, the American, and less so the Canadian plants, were, were existing and were getting kind of old. So that actually improved, you know, created a, a much, a much stronger uh, competitive condition against, uh, against the, the big three. At the time, in uh, 1983, let's say the early 80s, I uh, was uh, the director of, for automotive in the industry department. And at the time, I made an estimate that because of this wave of Japanese investment, also in Canada to some extent, there was a overcapacity in North America of about three million units a year. That's huge. Most of that, of course, what was at, what was at risk were uh, mainly old American plants. Now, in Canada, we, we were fortunate after the artifact that we had a lot of new investments, so our plants weren't as antiquated as many, many in the US. Notwithstanding all that, we in Canada uh, went after Japanese investment big time and were successful in mainly with Toyota and Honda. Uh, but we weren't that worried about the overcapacity issue because we were less vulnerable, we thought, than American plants. Uh, so going with that, we had this brilliant idea, why don't we get the Japanese companies to join the auto pact? After all, if they're investing in North America, uh, why don't they become part of it? Now, that, that would have required a negotiation because the way the auto pact was structured is that the beneficiaries were specific companies from a Canadian perspective. You actually have to be on a tariff order listed as one of the companies benefiting from it. Uh, the American companies wouldn't want that anyway because that's more competition. But we went ahead and uh, pursued the Japanese to start considering joining the auto pact. And I remember lecturing a large group of people in Tokyo at one time on the mechanics of, because it's a little complicated, of joining the auto pact and what stages they'd have to get to 
to get to those levels where they could actually become members of the Auto Pact. And to complement that, we subsequently uh, experimented with various schemes, tariff remission schemes, to help them along. Now, the, it turns out, now in retrospect, that we were being a little too clever by half by courting the Japanese companies because in the ensuing free trade negotiations, uh, the American companies got even. So this is a really great example of how companies influence or corporate sector influences trade negotiations. The way they got even was that if you look at the agreement, the 1988 agreement, even though the auto pact was kept intact, uh, actually Simon Reisman insisted that his auto pact not change, uh, but it stipulated that there would be no new entrants. And secondly, that whatever tariff remission orders Canada had would be phased out, which we did. So, the upshot of that was that the Japanese companies felt betrayed. We had been leading them along this path of saying, well, why don't you join the Auto Pact and we can sort out with our American counterparts how, how this could all work. They felt betrayed and their main point was that now this was a discriminatory arrangement. As you've already heard, the, um, this led over time to uh, the Japanese challenging the auto pack in the WTO. Now we knew going in we'd lose hands down and we did. Because on many grounds under the WTO this was an illegal practice. Uh, so we eventually had to rescind it formally in 2001. So that was the official demise of the auto pack. Now, to be frank, it didn't mean that much in any event because the commitments that the companies made were exceeded for many, many years. Uh, the practical difference was that the, the Japanese were not able to bring in their vehicles from Japan duty-free as were the American companies. So there was one decision that was left after this and I was in the room with John Manley, the industry minister at the time when we debated well, what do we do now with the tariff? There were three options we put to it. Leave it at where it is, which was 6.1%. Harmonize with the Americans, which was around 2%. Or go to zero and give the consumers in Canada a break. Well, you know what the result was. Be given that at the time, there were over 90 Liberal MPs in Ontario. So guess who won that debate? I conclude by saying that, you know, even without the auto pact, our production is maintained pretty well in Canada. We one to one more or less as we speak. In relative terms, we've declined though. So for example, Mexico is now roughly four to one if you're if you're doing comparisons. And that's why Trump got all excited about this. Because the actual production advantage is now based in Mexico. Um, so I think all in all, Canada's had a pretty good run in the auto sector. It's a good 50-year run. Uh, the Auto Pact was really instrumental in rationalizing the industry north-south. Uh, I guess on a last note, though, I'd say that the newly minted USMCA, now rebranded by President Trump, shows that what goes around comes around. So because the beneficiary of the auto provisions in the new agreement really are the Americans, or at least they think they are. So we've, we've gone from managed trade to free trade back to managed trade. And I think there would be an interesting case study here about that issue
and, and how we might have actually been a little too clever about how we managed this and in, in terms of going to free rather than keeping on a managed trade agenda. Uh, now in terms of just the last point I make in terms of the impact of this new agreement on Canada, uh, we have the Americans have quotas in the agreement on Canada. The good news is that the quota on our vehicle exports is about 50% higher than uh, we are now, and I don't think we're ever going to get up 50% more. Uh, and the quota on parts is roughly three times what we export now. So it's a, it's a bit of a fictitious quota. Uh, and by the way, my personal view is we wouldn't want to ever get that high anyway, because we're we're still over-invested in autos uh, in Canada, and we, don't, we shouldn't want to go there. However, uh, last point, who knows how this will play out. It, it will require the auto companies, and not just the American ones, but the, all the international ones, try and figure out how they're going to play in this new regime. And it'll disrupt their current plans but they're pretty adaptive, adaptive and, but it'll take a few years to sort out. So I thank you.